at the Cable Easel on Channel 6 of Viacom. Um, welcome to a program dedicated to instruction of painting and drawing, uh, or drawing and painting in that uh, order. I'm here to demonstrate, to talk to you about uh, the techniques, uh, the pitfalls and the successes of working from life, uh, going out and working right there on location. Uh, for this landscape painting uh, program that I have for you today. Um, an innovation has been done here with the television. I'm working from a monitor from right here next to me, which looks with a little bit of stretching of the imagination as if I'm looking out of a window at that particular scene. Uh, a crew from this uh, cable company went out and um, set up a camera and focused on the scene of my choice, namely this is on the south shore of the town of Islip, town of Babylon, I believe, called the um, Fire Island Lighthouse. It's an old structure. Funds are trying to be found in order to make it, uh, to re restore it. It's in a somewhat state of disrepair, but it is nevertheless an historic structure and a beacon, a landmark, just a little bit east of the Jones Beach Tower. Everyone, uh, I'm sure, that has been to Jones Beach and to the South Shore area knows the old the um, Fire Island Lighthouse. And we're here today with a clear, cloudless spring sky and the calm and remote scenery of the spit of land on which this lighthouse was built somewhere, I believe, at the turn of the century, possibly a little bit earlier than that. Well, it's a simple composition. It can actually be reduced into three elements with a few details. You have the sky element, you've got the lower half, which is the land mass, and then you've got that one interruption of the sky in the form of the lighthouse. It is the simplest possible comp composition and therefore probably one of the most difficult to make work because simple being more, more is less, as they say. This is probably the ultimate more is less landscape. Well, in order to be able to uh, place these particular motifs, I'm going to use uh, a red sable brush and a little bit of what I call tinted turpentine, and I'm going to show you the really simplified layout style of how to do it. The horizon, which means that it is a little bit below center, cutting the canvas virtually almost in half. And then this denotes our planet, the sky and the land. The one, the one motif here which tells you that this is inhabited is the placement of this lighthouse. It is pr the most simplified of, of compositions. The details come along later, namely the stripes on it, and this building outside, which I'm just going to show you the general placement of. But what we do is to work with these areas of color to begin with. The area of color, and that monitor may not be exactly uh, true to what there was. It looks pretty true. It's nice and pale, very simple, cloudless as I said, and ready to receive a mixture of quick drying white, Prussian blue, only a slight speck, a touch of Naples yellow to take care of Long Island's very special kind of atmosphere, which reduces the blue from a um, ultramarine color to more of a turquoise. And very, very pale because of the place on which this island is located uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. So I'm going to be applying this color very, very simply over a tinted canvas, 
I prepare these canvases because of the electronic problems that a pure white canvas presents and which uh, defeats the purpose of this descriptive uh, demonstration that I'm giving. So I prepare my canvas with a sort of a dull and lifeless color which helps both of us, uh, you and I, to be able to see how you go about the, um, the beginning from absolutely nothing to uh, presume, hopefully, a completed landscape painting. This is working from life, or as close to life as we can get, because we're relying on, on the electronic medium. However, when I do personally go out and paint, I make sure that I have enough time allotted, and my, uh, my for me, the um, a reasonable amount of time for me to be out before the light changes too dramatically and before I must pack up and go either because the weather has changed, the light has changed beyond being able to make any sense out of it is about four and a half to five hours. So if you're going to be working from life you may as well be prepared to spend that amount of time out of doors. If you are in the so-called wilderness, namely away from quick food places, you must take along enough to keep you, well, from being too thirsty on the site, especially in the summertime if you're out, and to also take along enough cleaning uh, things such as turpentine and cloths to be able to take care of the needs of cleaning up, which uh, something which can become rather messy. I'm going to be blending this uh, sky and eliminating the knife marks of my palette knife because this is a realistic technique to a degree and uh, eliminating the knife marks takes care of keeping it in that general style. Uh, working in palette knife is a different style and one would not smooth out the knife marks. But as you can see this is efficient, it's quick, it will cover an area in a, in a, in a nice uh, solid manner and not waste too much time with applying a great deal of color on a large surface. Now this is not that large a surface because if you are working with a great big four foot canvas then obviously you have to be able to go back the next day and um, catch the light and the scene with the same weather conditions uh, and at the about approximately the same hour. But putting on uh, a large area of perfectly plain color seems like maybe a waste of time, but when you're out there and you notice that the sky is actually an uninterrupted uh, uh, area, which tends to be slightly darker at the top or overhead, which is uh, the way I'm going, to, I'm going to try and do that for you now by showing you a technique which I haven't used before, but it is using a small amount of turpentine and some vibrant blue, and I'm going to blend it into this newly applied color. I'm going to put it in rather heavy. It's heavy in color. It's actually quite thin in, te in, in, um, in, te in uh, liquidity. And I'm going to blend it in right there on the canvas to give you that smooth, almost airbrush looking blend that you see on the monitor. It's done by using these quick drying colors, by tinting uh, some turpentine and giving the look of an overhead blend. It is hard to do. It is probably the most frustrating of all painting techniques is to get that smooth blend. However, you don't want it to look like an airbrush. You want it to look as if it has actually been painted with a brush by hand in small deliberate strokes. And so whatever slight irregularities there are, they can be accepted and passed very nicely and not have too much worry about how they look. The sky does have its mottled look. And besides that, the sky changes periodically over a matter of time. So that if there is a slightly mottled look to this particular study, that's fine. Now, as, you, uh, as we go down towards the lower half, the same thing happens. Atmosphere gives you a slightly lighter uh, color, and you can do the same kind of thing by applying a sort of a lighter uh, brush strokes, because Long Island has a very special atmosphere. And the horizon tends to become a little bit lighter, 
and oddly enough, in many instances, a little bit a little bit yellower, which gives it a turquoise look. But when you're dealing with a very uninterrupted uh, large span of color, such as one does here, you want to make sure that any slight deviation from the flatness of the blue is taken advantage of. So if you have a, um, the opportunity to introduce a very pale and subtle pink tone at the bottom to give you the look of this island's atmosphere, then by all means that's what you would latch on to. These are the things that you observe when you're out there on the scene, on location, and working from life. Uh, that has always been what I have touted for all these many, many years that I've been doing television demonstration of painting. Well, we have here the beginning, almost better than half of the canvas has been covered with uh, a tone uh, that has blended, let me, let me pull this down a little bit more because my land is going to come over that somewhat. Uh, just the placement of the lighthouse is all that was necessary in the beginning of this painting because as you can see you have to have the background prepared to receive the motif in front of it. You work from the rear to the foreground, in other words the most distant places and you work towards the foreground. Um, it is an elemental uh, technique to obviate the need to paint around objects. Well, uh, the uh, lighthouse, of course, being the interest, the focal point of this painting, is to be dealt with uh, by using very close uh, reference to the subject at hand, you would not interpret this because if you're going to take a painting and entitle it the, um, the Fire Island Light, it had jolly well better look like the Fire Island Light. Now, because it has been drawn just very slightly, I'm just going to go over the general shape of it and see whether or not I have it high enough in the painting and see whether the proportion is right. One can always change it. You're dealing with opaque oils meaning that errors can be corrected by simply overpainting. Watercolor is different. When you make a mistake in watercolor, you're pretty well stuck with it. I need to bring some of this background a little bit closer to the lighthouse. So give me a half a minute and let me pull that into there with a very slight, yes, there we are, because I have to make sure that it is logical. Uh, the top of this lighthouse was painted black. I do not believe this lighthouse is in operation right now. Funds are being raised uh, every year to try to get enough money to restore the lighthouse. And um, I have contributed paintings and auctions and so on to get the, to get the, uh, I, think, I think it must be the, the Department of the Interior that would head up the um, restoration of this lighthouse. The top of it has been painted black, although weather and time has reduced it to a sort of a charcoal look. And then at the top of it, and I'm going to once again show you, I'm going to show you how to use a stick to steady the hand. You rest your hand on uh, a, a stick which is used as a prop. Now the uh, top of this lighthouse uh, is going to be done with a different brush and it is a, well, it's obviously it's going to hold the light and it's a kind of a cage and can be done with a very simplified um, uh, sh description of the top of this, of this structure. It has, the, it has a roof arrangement, it houses the lantern, which at one time was essential for the navigational safety of this island, but now I do believe that it is taken care of probably by radar and any number of other electronic devices. But these relics of the past are, uh, are extremely charming and I think vital to be maintained uh, in their original form. Um, so the, uh, the structure of a lighthouse, they're all very individual, even though they're just great big uh, structures that stick up against a sky, they all have their own particular landmarks. And many, most of them, of course, have to be, for identification, be patterned in certain color schemes. The, uh, there are some that are diamond, 
uh, patterns, some are uh, stripes. This one happens to be a stripe of three colors. Um, we're going to be breaking in a very short uh, moment and come back. We're going to take a, a slight break and we'll come back and um, talk some more about the rendering of this very identifiable piece of architecture, the Fire Island Light. So don't go away. Come back in a minute. Back again with the uh, uh, the Fire Island Lighthouse. Uh, the um, identifying marks, as I was saying before, are uh, uh, particular to every single lighthouse, for obvious reasons. You have to be able to have some kind of mark. So this one happens to be brick. It's a brick lighthouse, but it has been painted. The top of which is black. The center is is white. The lower, the uh, just below the white, is an area of brick, which is no longer really brick color. It has kind of deteriorated, and it did have a black stripe at one time. It, the importance of these particular details are because if, uh, by some some awful turn of events, they decide to not save this lighthouse, they're going to be. Um, interested in seeing what it was like before, what it was like uh, just before it uh, maybe met an un untimely end. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, the, the paintings are very telling recorders. They, uh, they give something that um, descriptive um, things don't do. So be sure that when you are doing a specific place and will in fact title the painting let us say in this instance, the Fire Island Light, that you have it authentically and, and, and carefully recorded. That's one of the duties, I think, of the, uh, of the painter. Somewhere along the line, some, another black stripe was introduced here, and it is kind of worn off, but it should probably just be slightly indicated that even though time has done a job on these bricks, that there was probably another black stripe here to give it um, its identifying uh, uh, pattern. Uh, the, um, the need to uh, have these patterns was established, uh, obviously, many, many years ago. Well, the lighthouses of the world are, have always been interesting, even though we don't use them that much anymore. The Montauk Lighthouse, I believe, is still in working order, of course. This one is not. Um, the light is coming from uh, the south, I'm facing, this, this painting is facing east, and therefore the, uh, the light coming from the south will give a, uh, the shape of the lighthouse lightness on this side. Even though it's white, it does have its shadow, and that has to be recorded very carefully to, to tell you in this magical thing, uh, illusion of painting, that the lighthouse is round. The one way you can do that is by giving it its shadow such as you would on any cylinder. Uh, the basic knowledge of how to paint a round object, light on one side and dark on the other, uh, comes in very handy in instances such as this. There seems to be a rather uh, a prominent crack in the surface of this lighthouse that comes down at this angle. Another piece of um, recording that uh, is useful for the authenticity of this particular piece. 
Um, the reason that I have done the lighthouse first is to be able to see whether or not the proportion of this particular building is correct. Now I notice that it fans out on the side uh, rather gracefully this way. So that has got to be uh, carefully observed and recorded because that's what we're, we are in the painters are actually in the business of recording not only events but places and people and items and so on. So, oh here's another little black line coming along here that gives you the separation of the red and the white. So there is the there is the pattern that was established many years ago for this for this particular structure. Next to it and I'm going to draw it slightly first because I believe that you must draw things first is this old and rather ha and very handsome apparently uh, the light keeper's house or the lighthouse keeper's residence or it could be the Coast Guard station. I'm really not sure but I do know that the building is um, well probably way over uh, 75 years old and has its own particular landmark uh, look about it. These, um, these things are what interrupt the uh, bands of color known as the land and the sky. So there uh, is the beginning of the uh, putting down of that building. The roof seems to be red or red-ish and I'm going to keep that quite subdued because it is an old building and it certainly would not be brilliant red coming right out of the tube. So I'm using a combination of cadmium red, a touch of orange, a little bit of alizarin crimson and to see whether or not I can get as close to that color as, the, as my reference material tells me. Obviously the um, the selection of color is important also for the identifying of this particular structure. If you were to, if you were to not pay attention to that, somebody somewhere along the line would say she's wrong. The building is not that color. It is a brick color or red instead of brilliant. So uh, faithfulness is what one has to pay attention to when you're recording anything. The side of the building is a little bit lighter here, the side of the roof, because it is being uh, light, uh, light struck and even though it's a tiny area of the roof, it has to be faithfully recorded that it is got that mass to it. Um, it seems to be still fairly nice and white in the way of in the way of siding and, and very little of it shows let me see, it goes up here. Very little of it shows because it's covered with the uh, growth of, um, of dune, dune uh, foliage and grasses and so on. But it is enough there to, to peek out from, un, from behind the, uh, the greens. And that's how you would prepare this to receive the greens. There's a little bit of shadow underneath being cast by that heavy overhang building. So that can be put in as well, very interpretive way. I believe this would have a shadow or something close to it on the other side of the building. Well, whatever that large, I doubt uh, very much that that uh, large uh, structure sticking up out of the sky is um, a chimney. Oh, it seems to be some, it seems to be so. oh, it's in front of it. Well, you see, that's the, what the, the eyes, the, the, the eyes have tricks played on them. When you're far enough away from a structure, you can't tell whether or not it's in front of it or back of it, and it will look to me as though that's in front of it. Well, we are going to, let me, let me, let me speak to you for one moment about the creativity of the, um, of the artist inside. As I, as, as one would stand only slightly higher than where this uh, scene was taken, one would see uh, a brilliant uh, area of the Atlantic Ocean off here on the horizon. And I'm going to put that in, although the monitor may not be showing it, it was, it is nevertheless visible with only the slight elevation of the, um, of the eye. And uh, putting that in will tell you that uh, the ocean is on its is on your is to the south of the lighthouse. If you were to put it the other way, you would see that it would be something called the Great South Bay. Well, time is is, is not not necessarily our friend today, so I must tell you that putting the the um, uh, foliage in at this beach scene must be done very interpretively but I think that you will realize that uh, the simplicity of this canvas does not necessarily mean that it can be done in an enormous hurry. So I have here
the lighthouse, the, uh, the um, apparently the light keeper's house in the, uh, next to it in the distance. And here we coming to the, um, the very uh, loose style of, of putting this beach growth in uh, for, the, um, for the middle ground which is where we're dealing right now. Now, because there is so little time left in this particular study, I'm going to show you that the dunes would be important as uh, uh, the authenticity of this particular painting. The dunes uh, begin here towards the beach area. And nice and simple is the best way to do the dunes. They are, uh, they are done, I'm, doing, I'm using uh, Naples yellow, almost pure out of the tube, a touch of this uh, paint, paint called uh, flesh tone, which is uh, not, not necessarily a very intelligent name for that color, but that's it. And I'm going to show you also the interpretive way in which you can uh, designate these little other uh, white structures known as houses. They are sort of scattered through the landscape here and there, in, and you don't need to have very much uh, uh, going on to tell you about these buildings. Ooh, that brush is uh, dirty, so, f so I must follow my own advice and use a nice clean brush. So these buildings in the distance here uh, can be, um, as I, uh, just like sailboats in, in water, they can be interpreted very loosely. That same uh, color of the brick build, oh, that's a, that's a pointy roof here with a with a uh, brick colored build, uh, roof like that. Well, <laughs> we are trying to deal with um, that enemy of the painter, which is time, as well as uh, time and light. Uh, um, doing the foreground here is um, going to be mostly this wonderful bunch of dark greenish, um, I guess beach plums and sort of sage and and um, v very uh, localized kind of um, growth uh, that can be done and should be done with a lot of a lot of observation as well as with interpretation. In the foreground there are kind of beach grasses which tend to be maybe sometimes a little bit mauve or a little bit nondescript in tone and uh, that is what makes the relief of just this large green foreground which is what you find on any uh, beach setup a tremendous long uninterrupted span of beach grasses. So you must try to use as many different shades as possible to be able to get the feeling. Well, um, with uh, this kind of uh, really simplified design, which is what this is, this is a really simplified composition, does not necessarily mean that it's easy. It's actually uh, quite tricky to be able to make this kind of thing come off uh, believably. I hope that you've been able to use some of this information. Keep tuned for the next few programs so that I can tell you about my book, which is called Working From Life. Uh, keep your brushes clean, get out there and observe what there is around you, and if you are at all possessed, like I am, of painting landscapes, you'll paint from life. This is Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel, thanking you for watching, and bye-bye. <laughs>